voluntarily fund government operations while budget negotiations continue. The committee meeting got underway at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time. The chairman is New York Representative Gerald Solomon. 96% uh, Mr. Chairman of the 501c3s in the United States, 96% would not have any restrictions on their lobbying activity whatsoever. Why? Because they recognize that is not their principal role, and their current lobbying and political advocacy is far below the $25,000 threshold, which is in this legislation. And of course, no entity is affected whatsoever unless they choose to ask for and receive taxpayer-subsidized grants. This does not affect anyone else. It does not prevent anyone from engaging in lobbying or political advocacy. It merely says that if they desire to be subsidized by taxpayers, then an existing formula in the IRS code called the 501H formula will be applied to them mandatorily rather than by their option as is currently the case. And under that, there is a sliding scale there is an upper limit of $1 million that they could expend per year on lobbying. We make some definitional changes between political advocacy and lobbying, but we use the existing IRS code $1 million limitation. If, however, they are a group which receives more than a third of their money from the taxpayers, in essence acting as though they were a public agency, then we change that cap from a $1 million cap to a $100,000 cap. Unfortunately, you have organizations, some of which are 96% funded by taxpayers, some two-thirds funded by taxpayers, some 80% funded by taxpayers, and others at many different levels that insist on trying to engage with the benefit of this taxpayer assistance in major lobbying activity. Although they say they attempt to avoid direct use of taxpayers' money, they are permitted to transfer percentages of their federal grants under existing law into their general overhead for these purposes and to seek add-on grants for direct and indirect cost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have limitations on government agencies being able to do that, and we think that it's proper if someone is going to act as a government agency being so dependent upon taxpayers that they ought to have a similar limitation as a safeguard on what they are doing with taxpayers' money. Uh, that is just a, a brief synopsis of the legislation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would not, frankly, try to ask the committee to engage in a debate over it this evening, but I think it is a very important addition to the continuing resolution and certainly encourage uh, that it be part of that. Well, Ernie, I want to thank you for coming before us tonight and uh, enlightening us on the changes that, that have been made. I was a very strong supporter of the original language and uh, certainly support this as well. It's, uh, it's badly needed and uh, certainly the constituents I represent uh, want that language enacted into law and I commend you for it. Mr. Dreyer. No questions. Mr. Bielenson. Just very briefly so that people understand. Sure. You know, Mr. Istuk may, be, Istuk may be completely right. I happen to agree with him on, uh, disagree with him on the issue, but that's, that's neither here nor there. The point that we're confronted with, that there's no good reason for the leadership to have included this particular legislative matter in an appropriations bill in such a difficult time when we're having trouble enough getting a continuing resolution passed. It should be voted on and debated separately, as it will be in whatever bill it ends up finally uh, being in. This is entirely presumptuous of me, Mr. Chairman, because I am, as you know, a, a right. Democrat and proud of it. But it just seems to me that you folks are hurting yourselves politically by making it more difficult, since in fact you are the majority party in both houses of the, of the Congress, making it more difficult to get your legislative work done. People back home don't understand these interesting things that we do here, that you and I understand and we debate amongst one another. All they know, as Mr. Obi quite correctly pointed out, and some other people too, is that we're behind the times. I'm not saying whose fault it is, but you know, the Republicans are in charge this year, and we haven't gotten all the bills out, and they don't care what the reasons are. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not making a big deal of this. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying, why don't, why don't you report out a clean CR? The Democrats will vote for it. Some of your guys will vote for it. We'll continue things for two weeks. You know, why, why, I mean, I, I mean, uh, as I said, this may be the best proposal in the world. I don't think it is, but if it were, you still shouldn't include it in there. This doesn't belong in here. You know, any more than the next thing doesn't belong in here. Just some kind of a clean, continuing resolution. Instead of make, making it complicated and difficult, everybody back home is going to be saying, why don't they get the work done? And they don't understand this stuff. And that's all. I'm just trying to be helpful. Thanks.
Mr. Chairman. Tony, your points are well taken. The, the, uh, the truth of the matter is uh, we gave you a clean CR, and it was a six-week CR, which carried us from the end of the fiscal year on September 30th all the way up to November 13th. Another two and, weeks wouldn't hurt. And, and unfortunately, progress uh, in the Senate has not... Uh, not prove fruitful. But so, as you uh, know, this is not designed to help this progress through the Senate more yeah. quickly than it otherwise yeah. would. I, d I disagree. I well, think. Hope you're right. I think this is going to be a stimulant. Hope you're right, uh, Mr. Uh, Goss. Mr. Chairman, I would only say that uh, I, I, like most Americans, are probably infuriated when I see my tax dollars being used to propagandize me uh, on television and ads and other things. On the other hand, I want to make very sure that uh, this provision is constitutionally sound, because I feel that there are real concerns uh, between distinguishing between legitimate information Americans need to have and uh, advertising, which they don't need to have. Thank certainly. And, and, and in response to that, uh, you know, certainly the U.S. Supreme Court in a 1983 case uh, specified explicitly uh, that uh, neither Congress nor the taxpayers are required to subsidize any type of lobbying or political advocacy. And we are talking about groups that have chosen of their own volition to seek taxpayer funding for things. We're not talking about uh, totally independent operations, nor is any organization ever compelled. Uh, to seek taxpayer funding for something. But we have uh, gone to great pains. There is, for example, what's called a safe harbor provision uh, that is important for any group that wants to make sure that they have safeguards and protections. And we've been very sensitive to those issues. I share the gentleman's concern. Uh, we're making sure that we're, we're not concerned with actual free speech by groups. We're talking about taxpayer subsidized speech. And there's a key difference. Mr. Frost of Texas. Mr. Chairman, I find it curious that, that uh, people on your side in the House treat the Republican-controlled United States Senate as if it were some kind of foreign power. Uh, I think that the, the question that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Obi, the point that Mr. Obi made is that the Republicans are in control of the Senate, the Republicans are in control of the House. Why can't you all work all this out? Well, I'd be glad to tell the gentleman. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd be interested. The truth of the matter, we have rules, and we can expedite legislation in the House of Representatives. Unfortunately, <laughs> in the Senate, they don't have those rules, and one single member of the Senate, as you know, can block legislation for days and days on end. That's the difference. And it is not Republicans that are blocking the legislation over there. It is Democrats, and there's no question about that. Well, you have, uh, you have a, a working majority there. Uh, you can, uh, you're several votes short of uh, cloture. Uh, you can certainly get cloture if things are outrageous. Uh, Y'all are in control. You're in charge. And uh, I think what Mr. Obi was uh, suggesting was that we ought to, in the House, we ought to be doing things to make it possible for us to act quickly and possible for the Senate to act and for you to be able to convince your brethren in the, in the Senate that uh, they should uh, act responsibly rather than making it more difficult for us to reach agreement with the Senate. I mean, that's what's going on, is that we're, we're crafting a, a CR which will make it more difficult for you to convince your Republican brethren in the Senate to, to move this to the President rather than easier. And Mr. Istrick's proposal, while it's controversial, and while it certainly has people who believe in it, and the appropriate way to achieve his uh, legislative proposal was as you originally did, which was to attach it to one of the appropriation bills, which, as you did with the, I, I believe it was the Labor H HHS appropriation bill that it was originally attached to. And if it's such a good idea, work that out on the, uh, as the conference proceeds on that appropriation bill or one of the other appropriations bills. But attaching it to the CR makes it that much more difficult for you to negotiate with the United States Senate so we can get a CR in place. Uh, Mr. Frost, I just have to uh, tell you that uh, I participated in meetings all day long in and out of this meeting that we were at here. And the Republican Senate has agreed to this CR. That's why we're here. Uh, so it isn't that we have to get our Republican brethren to agree to it. They have already agreed to it over in the Senate. Uh, we just hope we don't run into a problem with the so-called bird rule, uh, which is going to require us to have 60 votes over there. But I don't think we will. Mr. Chairman, if I might Mr. interject. Uh, no. Uh, the, the Senate has twice voted on this topic. I realize their provisions were somewhat different and we have tried to meld those, but twice uh, the Senate has adopted uh, language trying to address this very concern. And we've taken the Senate language, we've taken the House language, we've taken other existing IRS language, and worked with senators to put that together. So this is not an item of first impression. Uh, for the U.S. Senate. And of course, as the gentleman correctly noted, uh, it, the House did elect earlier this year to put it on a, an appropriations measure. Uh, and therefore, you know, we are still on an appropriations measure of sorts 
uh, through the CR. Just what, why, would, why would it not be appropriate to pursue that to its logical conclusion of pursuing it through the Labor, Labor HHS Appropriations Bill, which ultimately will be worked out in conference and will come back to us? Well, it, uh, as I say, the Senate uh, had different vehicles. You know, we've had three or four different vehicles that between the two houses have been examined uh, already, some in the Senate, some in the House. Uh, so I think it's therefore incumbent on us to try to take a vehicle that helps to make sure we get the result, the issue resolved as quickly as possible. I think it's easier to resolve this way, frankly, uh, than it is on the, the Treasury Postal because the, the particular makeup of the conferees may not be reflective of the makeup of the Senate as a whole there. It's interesting the uh, way things work between the two houses, it particularly is. when the same party is in control of the two houses. That's, that's all I would observe. Are okay, there, I, I appreciate the yeah. time. I don't want to take any more sure. time. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Are there further questions of the, uh, of the witness? If not, uh, Ernie, we appreciate your coming before us tonight. Thank, Thank you, you very, Chairman. very much. The next witness will be uh, Mr. David Skaggs uh, of Colorado. Mr. Skaggs, if you would like to summarize your statement, the entire statement will appear in the record uh, without objection. It's nice to have you with us again, and uh, happy Thank birthday, Maureen. Semper Fi. Thank you. Happy birthday. Uh, I do not have a prepared statement, so uh, I will proceed uh, off the cuff, as it were. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the chance, especially at this hour, to testify. Uh, my testimony is very simple, and that is that given the fact that the uh, so-called ISTUK provision is included in the continuing resolution, uh, the rule should not protect that language from a point of order, or if it does protect it from a point of order, it surely should make an order, an amendment to strike it from the bill. Uh, that is, that should be the approach if indeed the majority is interested in seeing this CR enacted into law. Uh, the ISTUC amendment, as I think many members are aware, would regulate how people and organizations getting anything of value, not just federal grants, but anything of value from the federal government, could use their own money, not federal money, but how they could use their own money to participate in community and national affairs. This would tie up in miles of red tape some of this nation's most important charitable organizations in their efforts to provide services to our communities. It would get in the way of the efforts of the American Red Cross to work out in your county or in mine disaster preparedness arrangements with local governments. It would prevent the Cumberland YMCA in western Maryland from being able to use its resources effectively for its good works in the community because they would have to be diverted in part to comply with this regulatory scheme, scheme and bureaucracy, and at the same time to be liable for vigilante lawsuits brought by private citizens that happen to disagree with what they are about in the community. And it would get in the way of Mothers Against Drunk Driving in Mr. Goss's district or in the state legislature in Florida being able to advocate effectively for their concerns about drunk driving, about highway safety. Uh, it goes well beyond anything that uh, ought to be in an appropriations measure. In fact, it is stunningly irrelevant to this bill. Nonetheless, it constitutes 22 of the 38 pages in this bill. This language has already been examined by the chairman of the Republican the Republican chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. He has rejected it, as have other conferees, Republican conferees from the Senate on the Treasury Postal Bill, and made it very, very clear that they will not support it in the Senate. This is going nowhere in the Senate other than to require this CR to come back for yet another go around in the House after this provision is stripped out. We need to have another vote on this, Mr. Chairman. Yes, there was a vote on an earlier version of it on the Labor H bill back uh, late July, early August. There have been some changes made in the bill. More importantly, there have been an awful lot of changes made in the minds of our colleagues as they have had a chance to examine exactly how perverse and unconstitutional and un-American a provision this is. So uh, if it is going to stay in the bill, and evidently it is, uh, at, at the very least, a, a uh, motion 
an amendment to strike should be made in order in the floor so that we can have an opportunity for the body to work its will on this matter. And I suspect to send a somewhat cleaner CR onto the Senate than would otherwise occur. <coughs> we, uh, Skaggs, uh, I would uh, disagree with you on um, even your, uh, your description of the original language, much less this, uh, the Simpson language. Uh, which uh, is acceptable over in the Senate is primarily the language that is uh, in this bill now. No. But uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll see and we can debate it on the floor. Well, this is not the Simpson language, Mr. Chairman. This, it, is, not, this is not the Senator's provision, which was limited to 501c4. This is, this is a compromise with the Senator. That's why but, it bears oh, his but name. But only with Senator Simpson, not with the other Republican conferees on the Treasury Postal Bill, which right. explicitly rejected this. Well, I think the, uh, the provision is badly needed. I strongly support it. Uh, I don't see anything un-American about it. And you know me, I wouldn't be as, uh, supporting anything that's un-American, well, would I? I? I know we don't want to take the time tonight. I, I'd appreciate it if we could have about 15 minutes in your office sometime soon so we could talk about the details. You, you uh, as my former Marine buddy, you're welcome to come there anytime. Great. Uh, Mr. Goss, Mr. Bielenson, any questions of the witness? Mr. McGinnis. Chairman, just there briefly, uh, I'm confused. I, I think your description of uh, your description of non-American and uh, perverse are a little strong. I don't see it as non-American at all. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about when you say non-American. Is it because that you can go and take taxpayer dollars and come back here to Washington D.C. using those dollars and? lobby it, or is it because of other special interest groups out there that get government dollars and then use those government dollars for further lobbying? <coughs> not no. non-American. That's pretty strong language uh -huh. to use in here with somebody else's bill. I don't, that, it, it, very strong language. May I answer your, your question? Go ahead. Well, let me give you some examples, and, uh, and I realize it's strong language because I feel strongly about it, and I think strong language is absolutely warranted. Uh, an example, for instance. The American Red Cross will be limited in its political advocacy activities under this bill. That is, everything it does virtually to interact with government at the local, federal, and state levels to no more than a million dollars a year. They, they have an awful lot of very legitimate business to conduct with governmental entities at all levels to deal with the safety of the blood supply, to deal with emergency preparedness and a whole range of other activities. They happen to get federal grants, so they would be capped at $1 million. That's a lot of money, but for an organization that size, with all of its responsibilities, it is very constraining. But beyond the money limits, the reason that I say it is un-American is that the American Red Cross, for instance, would be required to file, to keep a whole separate set of books under this amendment because it is based on the federal fiscal year and accounting by the federal fiscal year. A whole separate set of books so that they could file their annual political advocacy report with several different federal government agencies according to the federal fiscal year. Be subject to lawsuits by anyone that thinks that they have exceeded their political advocacy, namely their free speech limits. And in that lawsuit, under the terms of this bill, they would have the burden of proof of showing their innocence. Not that the government would have to show that they had violated the law, they would have to prove that they're innocent. Not just by a preponderance of the evidence, as you as an attorney know is the, law, is the usual civil standard of proof, but by clear and convincing evidence. That's for starters. Now, you also need to realize that under the provisions of this legislation, anyone receiving anything of value from the federal government would be swept in its provisions. We have an opinion from a water conservancy district in our state of Colorado, Mr. McGinnis, that the receipt of Bureau of Reclamation water is a thing of value for purposes of triggering the entire regulatory scheme. And is of, that of your interpretation? Inter Where's that inter I don't see that in the bill. It's in the bill. If you look at the definition of grant, it is money or anything of value. The legal counsel for the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District has examined this proposal and determined, I think, quite logically, no. is a thing of value received from the federal government. You can go on and on and on. Let me give you another un-American example. 
I'm a recipient, hypothetically, or let's take a, a possible recipient of an SBA loan, which is a thing of value from the federal government that would trigger these restrictions. That business could not spend a dime of that federal thing of value with any organization that it might choose to do business with if that organization had spent more than 15% of its budget in the preceding year on this broad definition of political advocacy. That might include something as innocent as going through a rezoning and building permit exercise with the local county or city planning department. So you've got this bizarre notion that we here in Congress on a continuing resolution should be interfering in this kind of incredible bureaucratic scheme, big brother, big brother regulatory scheme, about those kinds of private transactions with private money involving constitutionally protected activities. I think that's perverse and un-American. Mr. Frost. Mm -hmm. Well, just to, uh, in saying goodbye to you, Mr. Skaggs, uh, you know. Au revoir, <laughs> please. <laughs> you, you seem to have turned this whole thing around. I've never heard such a bizarre uh, explanation of something. What we're trying please to do. Please read the bill, Mr. Chairman. It's I have all read, in there. Believe me, I have read the bill. And what we are trying to do is to keep these organizations from spending taxpayers' money lobbying the government to get more money. And we're going to stop this, we're going to cut down on these grants, and we're going to get the government out of the lives of other people. Thank you for coming. You, you know, there has not been one example shown of that happening. Oh, yes, there has, and you're going to see a lot more of it. Next witness is uh, our good friend uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, yes. Uh, and it's good to see you all in one piece. Yes, thank sir. you. Sir. And I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, as the gentleman sits down, if we had a adopted his approach sometime ago, we wouldn't exactly have to discuss right. this nonsense. That's exactly the point. And I'm beginning I to look more and more fondly upon both this gentleman and his proposal. Let me, let the reason me. I was so uh, so happy to see him here in one piece, uh, our good friend was mugged uh, the other night on his front porch uh, in his home, I understand. I'd rather say I, I received a I received a token of uh, steel. Uh-huh. Uh, Beside the head. On, on the head, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm glad you went down fighting and didn't... Uh, yes, I did that. Uh, I was right. not knocked out, uh -huh. something which I fear is going to happen here. <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, Tony is absolutely correct. Let me just Let the record show this is Mr. Yes. Geekus of Pennsylvania. Yes. You have the floor, sir. Mr. Obie and others, and we all recognize that the current, the CR that you're planning to produce for tomorrow is going to last till December the 1st. <laughs> It may be inhumanly possible to produce another CR uh, two days beforehand, except with a rush model, uh, one that will cause possibly consternation and uh, uh, lost energy all around the place. If my instant replay legislation were adopted, at the end of this current CR, the one that you're passing tomorrow, on December the 1st, if nothing has happened, we simply repeat it automatically. Automatically on December the 2nd, there would go into effect the parameters of the CR, which has expired on December the 1st. And it will continue until the negotiations, which will be prompted by, the, by this uh, new CR, uh, will produce a separate uh, appropriations bill for any one of the 13 that are missing. That's a simple proposition. I'm wondering how we can continually rebuff this proposition when, in, in fact, during the Reagan years, although it was the Democrats who did it at that time, they passed CRs that lasted a year. At, I, I didn't see the government crashing down because this was a CR that was continuing the appropriations at a given level to the next fiscal year's end. What is good for Republicans here under my proposition is that we continue the lowest ebb of, a lowest flow of money possible as prescribed in your own CR. That, if we did nothing else, would bring us to the seven-year balanced budget in four years, in my judgment, half the time. So what do, what do we lose as Republicans by doing my instant replay 
and say that the president abdicates his responsibility and never sits down to negotiate at all on any portion of any appropriations, we continue our low level of appropriations uh, until those negotiations are fruitful. What do the Democrats gain from, from this? If for my <coughs> bill, they, they guarantee, they help guarantee, as we all do, no stoppage of government, no train wreck. That's a benefit for everyone. No federal worker will be under the threat of a furlough or any of the uh, inconsistencies that happen to a federal employee if, uh, if a government should shut down. Number two, does that allow the president to continue to negotiate? Is there any reason for him to continue to negotiate? Yes, because in your CR, you zero out some programs that are very valuable to the president. He'll want to negotiate to try to get some of those back. You will want to, uh, to zero out and negotiate there, and so you will need to negotiate. Meanwhile, the government goes on. And at the lowest fiscal levels possible of, of expenditures, leading us to the golden era of the uh, balanced budget, even if we never get down to uh, the, the business of appropriation again. It's time to do this. It, it's so simple of, uh, of, uh, of a proposition. Maybe that's why it'll never pass. But really, I'm, I'm intent on it. I'm going to be back here again and again, and I'll visit you in California, Tony, next year to tell you why I failed next year. But uh, I, I, I am intent on it, and I see this as a, a wonderful solution for our December the 1st dilemma, which may or may not occur, but I don't see how we can avoid uh, the approaching uh, two trains on December the 1st again. That's it. Thank you very much. You are very welcome, and we appreciate your coming before us. Right. Thank you very much. The next witness uh, is... I believe Mr. Nick Smith, accompanied by Mr. Shays. Or vice versa. Uh, Mr. Shays, accompanied by Mr. Nick Smith. One is from Connecticut and the other is from Michigan. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, if you both would uh, feel free to summarize your statements, it, uh, uh, feel free to take as much time as you like, but your entire statement would appear in the record without objection. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, Mr. Smith. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, start making a few comments on what uh, we're suggesting as far as an addition to the continuing resolution, and then uh, Mr. Shays will, will follow up. Uh, the bill that we've introduced is 2098. <coughs> uh, we have approximately 50 co-sponsors. Uh, the concept has been supported by leadership. Uh, you have in front of you, uh, uh, to the extent uh, that it clarifies some of the concerns, two editorials, one in the Wall Street Journal, uh, supporting 2098 and also an editorial in the Washington Times. 2098 simply makes it clear uh, that the, uh, 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 the president can prioritize spending if there is a cash flow problem because of, uh, because of the fact that the debt ceiling has been reached. Now, uh, a lot of people earlier thought that in all probability the, uh, uh, the managing CEO of this country would have authority to prioritize spending. So more important spending, spending that affects the health and well-being of individuals uh, could be prioritized ahead of those kind of expenditures that could be easily delayed. Secretary Rubin met with several of us. He said specifically uh, to his knowledge and understanding he has no such authority. Uh, it seems reasonable that we give him the authority in as much in as much as there is a reasonable possibility that uh, the uh, uh, debt ceiling is going to be reached, that there very well meet, might be a cash flow problem in this country. And if that's the case, then we need the kind of uh, best possible management uh, uh, by the President of the United States. And uh, uh, it seems reasonable that if the President feels that he lacks the, the power to prioritize, then he is simply go with a first in, first out. Considering the fact that there are 3,200,000 checks or other transfers by federal government issued every day from an estimated 11,000 locations, uh, we should uh, require that the President do prioritize that the Secretary of Treasury manage the cash flow in the most appropriate way. Uh, many of us are concerned that we're going to uh, 
that we're going to insist that we have a, uh, a balanced budget by the year 2002. We're suggesting that we use the uh, debt ceiling as part of the leverage to achieve that goal. And so the likelihood that the cash flow is going to be a problem is real, and we're suggesting you should include this in the CR. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my partner, uh, Nick Smith, has become a true expert on the whole issue of the debt ceiling and our national debt, and uh, I'm pleased to be able to join him in supporting uh, your place in H.R. 2098 in the continuing resolution. And I want to say why I feel this is so strong, <coughs> why it's, I feel so strong about this and why I think it is so important. For 25 years, our nation has incurred incredible deficits. Our, for 25 years, our nation has incurred incredible deficits that have resulted in our national debt going from about $350 billion to $4,900 billion dollars or 4.9 billion dollars trillion, trillion. Tr trillion 4.9 trillion uh, this is an absolute disgrace of which too many people have been a part of and we decided when we uh, gained control of this Congress that we would get our financial house in order in seven years and balance our federal budget we also uh, are working to save our trust funds particularly Medicare mm -hmm. And our third effort is to transform our social and corporate welfare state into an opportunity society. We simply have to balance the budget in seven years or less if we are going to care about the next generation to come. I mean, the only way we can show our gratitude for past, what past generations have done for us is to care about future generations. We now have a president who is not willing to weigh in on a seven-year budget. We have a president who's willing to let the deficits go up and up and up. And it has come to our conclusion, there are a number of us who have no intention to increase the debt ceiling, a temporary debt ceiling, until this president agrees in writing to us balancing the budget in seven years, agrees in writing to balancing the budget in seven years, and um, uh, then we're willing to vote for a temporary increase in the debt ceiling. There are a number of us in Congress who won't vote for a permanent increase in the debt ceiling until we actually have a certified budget that balances in seven years. So given that circumstance, this president and this, uh, this administration deserve what any administration has in any government, the ability to pay some bills and not to pay others. The issue is not that we are going to not pay our debt. The question is, are we going to defer, because we haven't raised the debt ceiling, paying the interest payments on a timely basis? That may happen. It may be that we do not have the money necessary, and therefore the, the, the administration needs the ability to decide that, of course, Social Security recipients should be paid before a vendor is paid. And without this legislation, uh, Mr. Smith and I are, are concerned that uh, Social Security recipients may not be paid and some others less worthy of payment may be paid. And therefore, we strongly advocate uh, that H.R. 2098 uh, be included in your continuing resolution. Mr. Chairman, I would like to add that Mr. Chris Cox had requested to testify before the committee in support of the inclusion of these provisions uh, in the continuing resolution, but he is uh, feeling poorly and ask uh, that we uh, uh, that he be excused as mr cox uh, uh, included this in his uh, uh, in his budget reform measures do you know i don't know we have a budget process but reform i i i know he has written uh, signed a dear colleague uh, suggesting that other members uh, uh, sign this leg sign on to this legislation are there any questions uh, from the witness uh, for the witnesses from either side if I could just for a moment, I don't want to want to ask these witnesses any questions, but I do want to inquire as to the schedule for tomorrow, uh, as to um, what our situation is going to be on the uh, companion legislation on the debt ceiling. We believe that we will not be meeting until 4 o'clock tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't foresee any change in that. But at that time, we would probably be taking up the... Uh, the uh, extension of the debt limit. Do we anticipate that the CR will be on the floor tomorrow? Yes, we do. And then the debt ceiling would be on the floor on the, Thursday? The following day. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, Thank gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.J. Res 115, the further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 1996, a modified closed rule providing one hour of general debate divided equally between the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. The rule provides for the immediate consideration of the joint resolution in the House without the intervention of any point of order. 
The rule provides one motion to amend by the chairman of the Committee on Appropriations or his designee, which will not be subject to any point of order or demand for division of the question, will be considered as read and will be debatable for 20 minutes. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit, which may include instructions only if offered by the minority leader or his designee. You've heard the uh, motion by the uh, gentleman from uh, California. Is there any discussion or amendments? Mr. Chairman, Bielinson? We have a few amendments, but it'll just take a very few minutes. Go right ahead. I'm not sure if you have the list of them in front of you or not. No, we don't. Is there more than one? Yeah. There is? There are four or five. Yeah, but that... How many? Four or five, but they're going to be done very quickly, Mr. Chairman, if you... Okay, before, uh, before recognizing you for that purpose, uh, the, uh, the rule before you contains uh, a um, provision providing for a motion to amend uh, by the Chairman of the Committee on Appropriations or his designee, uh, which shall be in order without intervention of any point of order or demand for division of the question, shall be considered as read and shall be separately debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and the opponent. That is uh, number two provision in the rule. And uh, I've been in touch with, uh, with the Appropriations Committee and with the leadership, and uh, they do not intend to add anything further to this bill other than what we have here in front of us. And I think because of that, I'll move. I would entertain a Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move that we strike, strike I move we strike number that. two and uh, change number three to number two. So and you would, and Mr. Linder would so move. Any discussion on that motion? Chairman, I think it's a very good move, and I think that uh, can gain bipartisan support. And let's hope, in light of this, that we'll see bipartisan support all the way down the line for this. Very good. Mr. Any, Chairman, uh, Mr. Clear, uh, Frost. Clearly, it is the right thing to do. Uh, and um, clearly, that's something that uh, Mr. Obi indicated that uh, he had not been advised that this was actually going to happen. So clearly, this should be dropped from the This road. was one of our amendments, so we won't oh, have to it offer was? it. Thanks. Oh. Yes. Well, all those in favor of the Linder motion will say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. And let the record show that the ayes have it and the uh, amendment is agreed to and the, uh, that section of the rule is, is uh, no longer in the rule. Uh, are there further amendments to the resolution? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, I'm, I move that the committee make an order and amendment to, the, to be offered by Representative Obie and the amendment be granted the appropriate waivers. The amendment is debatable for one hour, equally divided and controlled, is not subject to amendment, and is considered as read. The amendment is a clean continuing resolution without non-germane or extraneous Where matters. I have to ask the Do staff. Do we have a text of the amendment? Uh, I'll have to ask the staff. Yeah. But just briefly explain the amendment since we've just been had yes, it. Yes, it's, it's a clean uh, CR. It's a clean CR. Clean, clean CR. I think everybody understands. We've been what debating that is. this for the last several hours. I think everybody it understands it. It goes to it. December thirteenth. I've been advised. Right. Uh, uh, that's critical. What is the duration? Uh, December thirteenth. And it's a clean CR. At what rate? Is it the same rate as the present CR? The answer is yes. Okay, same provisions as to new initiatives and same provisions as to projects that are being uh, phased out? Um, I don't believe so. I'll have Wouldn't to ask. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Is it a clean CR on the basis of the CR we have now, or is it a clean CR as, quote, clean CRs? Which, what I want to know is what is it we're continuing from? Give <laughs> of while they uh, while they are uh, discussing this over there in uh, in private, no, I want to uh, just point out that if we go back to a clean CR, this uh, this knocks out a lot of programs. I think, like the president's, we were trying to be cooperative. It answered your question. It does not have the uh, six terminations. But it does it not have the six terminations. Same rate as we are currently operating under, but it does not have the six terminations. But it does go back to the lesser of the two ap appropriation yes, bills. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And that means that something like AmeriCorps that was uh, was zeroed out in the House bill is no longer funded at any level. No, it has the provision for ninety percent. No, no. It has the ninety percent of current. Rate. It has the provision for ninety percent of current rate. I've been advised. Oh, ninety percent of current rate. Same as the existing instead, CR. Instead of the same as the existing CR, the one that is in place right now. The existing CR has sixty percent. No, not the one that's before us, but the one that was passed on October 1st, effective October 1st. Mr. Oh. Chairman, so yeah. their, their view of cleanliness is a much higher level of spending. I mean, is it correct? See, I've been that? advised it's the same rate that was authorized for the period beginning October 1st. Okay. So higher well, level you all, of cleanliness, uh, such as with air and water, too. You all understand this, uh, this amendment. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. All, all those opposed, nay, no. nay, and the amendment is not but agreed to. Roll call on that. Roll Mr. call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Well, Dreyer? No. Dreyer votes no. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Goss votes no. Mr. Linder? No. Mr. Linder votes no. Mr. Price? Yes. No. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Diaz Valar? No. Mr. Diaz Valar votes no. Mr. Dennis votes no. Mr. Dennis votes no. Mr. Walpole? Mr. Mobley? Mr. Dealing? Yes. Mr. Dealing votes yes. Mr. Frost? Yes. No. <laughs> the clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the resolution? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. Well, Mr. Bielens, sir. Thanks. The amendment would strike Title III of the joint resolution, which would prohibit the nonprofit organizations which receive federal funds from lobbying the federal government. That is, of course, in relative, relative to the um, ISTUK right. um, proposal and has nothing to do with its merits which doesn't have very many of some of us think, but with the fact that it doesn't belong in this bill. Uh, we spent uh, much time debating this, uh, this matter earlier. I don't think it requires any further debate. Uh, if there is no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay, nay. Oh. And the amendment is not agreed to. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no. Mr. Goss? No. Uh, votes no. Mr. Lender? No. Mr. Lender votes no. Mr. Price? Mr. Price. Yeah. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Diaz Valar? No. Mr. Diaz Valar votes no. Mr. Guinness votes no. Mr. Walpo? Mr. Mowgli? Yes. 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 Mr. Paul? Mr. No. Clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the resolution? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. I have an amendment to the rule. The amendment would strike the provision relating to the determination of Medicare Part B premiums. The, uh, you've, uh, we've also debated this issue at length. Uh, if there is no further discussion on the amendment, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed to. And that, a roll Mr. call Chairman. is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Dreyer no. Mr. no. Yes. No. And the clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the Mr. resolution? Chairman. Mr. Bielens. This is our, our final one. We appreciate your Appreciate it being the final one. Yes, sir. Um, this, and a particularly reasonable one, may I add, which also has to do with ISTUC, the ISTUC Simpson problem. Yes. But perhaps in a more reasonable manner, which you all might like. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately following uh, three in parentheses in the resolution, insert the following, quote, one motion to amend by Representative Skaggs of Colorado or his designee, Printed in the report accompanying this resolution shall be in order without any point of order, shall be considered as read, shall be separately debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, semicolon, and four, in parenthesis, end of quote. Mr. Chairman, this amendment simply would allow Mr. Skaggs or someone else, his designee, the opportunity to offer an amendment to strike the ISTUC language related to political advocacy for the consumer resolution. So you still Keep it in there, but we'd have a chance to vote on it as a separate item. Well, let me just <laughs> say to the gentleman That's that pretty reasonable, don't you suppose? Um, anything you offer is always reasonable, but uh, sometimes untimely. Uh, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, as the gentleman knows, the, the Skaggs Amendment was defeated on the floor of the Congress by, I believe, more than 50 votes at the time. He seems to think he's going to uh, do better next uh, time. Well, I think he'd do uh, not as good because uh, the amendment has been considerably watered down and changed uh, to meet some of the objections. So uh, in my opinion, it would lose by 100 votes this time. But um, nevertheless, uh, all those in favor of the Bielens Amendment will say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay, no. nay. And the amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No. Mr. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Goss votes no, Mr. Linder. No. Mr. Linder votes no, Mr. Price. Aye. No. And the clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments or discussion to the resolution? If not, uh, we will vote on reporting the resolution to the floor. 
All those in favor of reporting the resolution will say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And the amendment, yeah, the resolution is agreed to. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, aye. Dreyer votes aye, Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Goss votes aye, Mr. Linder. Aye. Mr. Linder votes aye, Ms. Price. Aye. Ms. Price votes aye, Mr. Diaz Villar. Yes. Mr. Diaz Villar votes yes, Mr. McGinnis. Yes. Mr. McGinnis aye. votes yes. Mr. Wall votes. Mr. Mobley. Mr. Beelins no. Mr. Beelins votes no. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Frost votes no. Mr. Hall. Chairman Solomon. No. Uh, yes. Aye. <laughs> Uh, and the clerk will announce the results. And the resolution is reported. And uh, carrying for the majority will be Mr. Dreyer of California. Well, and for the minority. Maybe myself or, or Mr. Mr. Bielinson or his designee. Uh, might I remind Mr. Dreyer that he has to file this report yet yes, tonight. And Mr. Goss, you will stand by to be the acting speaker while he does that. You will do as you're told. <laughs> Gentlemen, this concludes our business for this evening. We will see you at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks, guys. committee this evening has been laying the groundwork for tomorrow's expected debate on a continuing resolution. The CR would continue funding of most government programs until the fiscal year 96 appropriations process is complete. The resolution would replace one which is set to expire next week. The Rules Committee determines the amount of overall debate time along with the amending process. The recommended rules package now goes to the House floor. Shortly, we'll see the filing of that rule, which must lay overnight so the debate can take place tomorrow. The Senate meets tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Members will continue working on a bill banning so-called partial birth abortions. Watch live Senate coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN 2.